Okay, so welcome to the tutorial, and we're giving examples and exercises. <coughs> so a real number is algebraic if there exists finally many integers such that not all zeros, such that the linear combination, right? It's not linear combination, it's equal to zero. Otherwise, it's called transcendental. As equivalent as saying there exists finite, we can replace by rationals. It doesn't matter, right? It's easy to say. Okay, now we observe that a real number is algebraic if and only if this is literally dependent in R over Q. Right? By definition of literally dependent. And we let this denote the set of all algebraic numbers. And the claim is that it is countable. The set of all algebraic numbers are countable. Okay, so here's a proof. We consider this for each alpha right we know that there is finally many rational not all zeros such as this so we can define the mapping such that it maps to this and because it's all but finitely are zero are not zero right so we have infinite many zeros so we're good we're in this set and so this right each element we have alpha we have mapped to an element in here so here we have a bijection right the image is bijective with its own image and a subset of this if this is a subset of this and this set is countable which means that this is countable and i'm telling you that the proof is wrong why because this mapping is not necessarily well defined right such expression it only says there exists but does not say that there exists a unique. So this mapping is not well defined. So here's the actual proof. The set of all polynomials with rational coefficients is countable. Okay? Then for each polynomial, we define the root, the set of roots such that each each of them we have a corresponding set of roots such that Px is equal to zero. And this is a finite set by fundamental theorem L algebra. And then the set of all algebraic numbers is really just this union. And a countable union of finite sets is again countable. So we're done. Okay, next, V is a vector space over field and we have this relation. Then S1 is dependent means that S2 is dependent. Which means that if S2 is independent, then S1 is independent. So this fits our intuition, right? Because if S2 has no redundancy, a set smaller than S2, of course, should not have any redundancy. So here's the proof. This means that, followed by definition, and we know that each Y1 is an S1, and S1 is a subset of S2, then S2 is dependent. Okay? Next. V is a vector space over F as is a subset and we show S is dependent if and only if there exists a proper subset of S such that they span the same. So this describes the redundancy, right? A set that's strictly contained, properly contained. So for this direction, suppose it's dependent, we copy down the definition and so without loss of generality, we suppose kappa 1 is non-zero. Then we can isolate y1 as this. And this is again in span s. Okay, so this is in span s. What do we want to show? If we can show this as equal to span s, then we're done. The existence is proven, right? We construct one set. So this direction is trivial, right? And for this direction, we consider this, where each gamma is in F and SI are in S. If we don't include Y1, there's nothing to prove, right? It's basically, it's basically span in S, right? If, if Y1 is not included, there's nothing to prove. So we must include Y1. Then we have this linear combination, right? We do the substitution here. We do the substitution, and then we rearrange, we will see that it's in span S. Okay, so this direction is done. Now we want to show that this direction. We 
pick X and here. Then, which means that X can be written as this for all VJ and S0, but not an S. Okay? All the VJs are in S0. Now we remove it because negative 1 is not equal to 0, so x is not, and x is also not an x naught. So all of them are distinct, which means that s is linearly dependent. Right? Okay, one more, two more exercise. I think it's one more, yeah. One more. So for b is a set of, is a collection of elements collection of vectors such as independent and the spans b. So for those you might know that this is called a basis of v. Okay. Then for each element in the index set we let w of lambda equal belongs to the space. And we want to prove that there exists a unique linear map such that it maps each b lambda to the corresponding w lambda for all lambda in the index set. Okay, so since we prove it, since it spans v, so for each v, there is a unique distinct element, right? Such that we have an expression. So we can define, we might guess, we define the learned map as tv to we have this and it maps to this, right? We show that t is well defined. Well, t is well defined because b is linearly independent. This expression is unique. And this is easy to check. And we want to show that t is linear. So we want to show that it's closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Then that's it, right? No, not closed. I mean, distributive, kind of distributive thing, right? So v1 is expressed like this, and v2 can be expressed like this. Then kv1 is t of, we bring kappa, wait, we bring kappa in, and then after mapping, right, after the mapping, and then we group kappa. Well, this is basically, again, tv1. So we can pull out the kappa. Okay, addition. We just add them and then we can group them. So if there's duplicate between those elements, if there's duplicates like this between those two, we group them. Right? We group them and then after we after the map T, we're mapped to W, right? And then we distribute it. Okay? So this is okay, this operation is fine. So we can do this. Now this is equal to tv1 plus tv2. And again, we want to show that t is unique. Suppose there's a linear learning that has this property, then for any v, we have a unique expression that sv is equal to this, because s is linear, and also s maps v lambda to all w lambda, but this each w lambda is also p t of v lambda. And then we use the linear property to conclude that it's equal to t. Okay, and that's it.